For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. There he's making that statement. He's reminding them again. Uh, Mark 10, 15. Mark 10, 15. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. That's pretty profound here. We're going to have to find out exactly what he's talking about. Luke 18, 17. Luke 18, 17. But he looked at them and said, Hold on, I think I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay. Luke 18, 17. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. I was trying to figure out exactly what he's meaning with all this. And I think the one verse that really uh, kind of explains it, what he's getting at, is found in 1 Peter. Let's turn there. First Peter two, first two. We'll start off with the one. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and evil and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So I think that's what Jesus re is referring to back in Matthew. Therefore, putting aside all malice, you think of little children. They're not filled with malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and slander. It says, be like newborn babes. Instead of concentrating on that as your needs, Seek the pure milk of the word. Let that be with The child is innocent. You've got to remember that. That's the yeah. innocent. <coughs> that's uh, not just humble, but uh, he's innocent. And that also, sorry, the child has a blur to hate. Some, some kids, you don't want to be like some kids. I mean, you can always find an exception to the rule. I mean, there are some kids, let's face it, they're just little brats. Now, maybe they're raised that way, I don't know, but it's, Jesus isn't saying, be a little brat, because this is the kind of people that's going to inherit the kingdom. I mean, there's anything you can find exceptions to, but in I'm, general. I'm glad you brought that up, because I was thinking, I can't think of the prophet, but he was bald-headed going past the town. And all the kids come out and he's throwing stones at him and calling him old bald head. And God sent two sheep bears out to kill 40 kids in that case. <laughs> Not all kids are sweet. That was the light shot. The light shot. Again, I'm not, I don't want to get into all the exceptions to the rule because you know you can find we know what he's talking about. I think second or first Peter two two really explains it, you know putting off all malice and envy and greed you know that kind of thing. Also, like Matthew it says, whoever humbles himself like a child, so that must be another quality he wants that he sees in children. 
I was just going to say it's like a rebirth. Now, you, you know, yeah, and if you look at uh, uh, Philippians, is it chapter 2, the verse that we, we actually this past couple of years have been referencing that quite a bit, where Christ emptied himself. He humbled himself. He's the ultimate example. He gave up the throne and took on the flesh. We can't even comprehend that, how much he had humbled himself, even to the death on the cross. He humbled himself. When you take a, a young child like that and they look up, and you should say, he has an older brother, they look up to, to their older brother, they look up to their father, they look up. It's called unconditional love. And that, that is really something special. Unconditional love. It's, it's the greatest thing there is. Well, look how we get corrupted the older we get. <laughs> you know, uh, well, let me explain that. Uh, the world corrupts us. And actually, he touches on that. There's enough woes in the world uh, that can corrupt you. That's like uh, prejudice doesn't come naturally. Uh, you know, we've all born into sin, so that's, <laughs> and that's why we, we have Christ our church to guide us, to help us do all this, to ease some of our pain, to help us go to the hardest places. You know, and God teaches us humility all throughout the Bible, not just the New Testament. It's, you know, you, I think, it, like I just said, in Philippians, when Jesus humbled himself. What about when Jesus washed the feet of the you know, disciples? He had a and he, he told Peter, I want to wash your feet. And he goes, oh, uh, you can't do that. He said, no. so Jesus is constantly teaching him humility. Not just with his words, but in his actions and the way he does things. He's telling me, you, know, you, you guys are worried about who's going to be the greatest. Well, that's how children learn. They learn more by their actions than what you tell them. Do as I say, not as I do. But what they do, do as you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, oh, yeah. That's like if, if, you know, someone's on the phone and they got their kid there and they get an argument on the telephone, all they have to use is one curse word and that kid's going to pick that curse word up. Out of all the words you said on here, that's the one you're going to pick up. You know, they're innocent. They're, they're open-minded. Anyone else on it? I think in this verse, because he goes on to explain about how if you would hurt one of these children, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think he's like talking in a way about new Christians when they come in. That's how they get into the kingdom by humbling themselves and being like a child. But then I think he goes on to describe how you treat these new Christians. But he doesn't expect you to stay on the milk like we were talking. He expects you to graduate to the meat. But to enter into the kingdom. And we all have to remain humble. Oh, right. Yeah. Debbie, please. Well, I just, when she was talking about that, I was thinking, you know, not to put some of the uh, traditions and strictures and stuff on on them that would be done away to become a Christian. But not to make you still go back to the old, to the law, and try to make them use that as well as, you know. Well, that's, I think you're touching on the next couple of verses here. Whoever then humbles himself as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So I could just picture the, you know, these disciples he's telling us to all trying to be more humble than the one next to them. And the only result, the result of that, they'll all benefit. Better than if they're all fighting amongst each other to be the greatest, then they're fighting. But if you're just trying to be humble, you're not fighting. And he said, then he goes on, and whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, 
it is better for, the, for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. I, I, I don't, I think he's, he's going beyond just talking about a child here. I think it's what Maggie touched on. I, I think he's talking about a newborn baby Christ and that if anyone causes them to stumble, and we, we learn through reading these the New Testament books that there were a lot of opposition. There was a lot of opposition to Christianity. And the biggest obstacle was the Jews who were constantly going after them. And it's kind of a veiled warning. <laughs> but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe me to stumble is better in other words, you're going to get punished. It's better that you get a millstone tied around your neck from the sea. Verse 7. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. Woe to the world. Woes are, are not good. <laughs> it's almost a judgment. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. The world's full of for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. So he's not saying you're going to be protected. You know, these uh, some of these preachers that preach, once you accept Christ, everything's going to be hunky-dory and good and sweet and wonderful. Well, stumbling blocks are going to come our way. <coughs> but we don't have to trip on them. We can jump on them. Stumbling blocks will come our way. It's inevitable. But he goes on to say, but woe to that man. In other words, judgment to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. That's just a, a continuation of what he said in the previous two verses. Really. If you cause someone to fall away, it's not good for you. It's better if you had a millstone tied around your neck and thrown in a mosquito lake. Now, we get any, any comments on any verses there? Yeah, that, uh, you mentioned the world that mind reads, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. And he also mentions uh, the world that uh, a couple other places it's like it's a battleground. You know, it, it, it's just like it's a battleground. You have to fight. Fight all, all the way to be good, to fight the evil. Well, it is. It's a, a, don't follow the world the way of the world. And, uh, well, in Ephesians, what we six, we read about the uh, putting on the armor of God. Yeah. When we put armor on and carry a sword, that's to be ready for battle. And I, I, it's just like the, the, the world is not here to have a battle around. <laughs> I always <laughs> wanted to do a sermon on the armament. And I was reading up on some of the Roman sandals that the soldiers wore. They designed them so that you could go forward easily, but it was hard to step backwards with those sandals, them shoes there. But it's inevitable that stumbling blocks are going to come, and how are we going to, you know, what are we going to do about it? Verse 8. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fire of hell. Wow. I don't take that literally. What type of example would you give then? I mean, I know you don't take it as you, what would the metaphor of hand or foot or eye be? Well, what I, what I see here is, well, look, if I, if my uh, right foot caused me to, to sin, whatever that sin would be, and I chopped it off, that's not going to stop me from sinning with my left foot. Yeah, but what right. example would be that, I mean, obviously feet are good, they, and hands and eyes, but what, like, what type of hand or foot would you kind of cut out of your life? I mean, well, what, 
things you look at. <clears throat> what are you what are you looking at? Uh, things you might walk into. To me, it's more of a brain issue, what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's all about the brain. See, now I don't think Jesus is teaching bodily self-mutilation here either. I mean, what about when he talks about the Lord's Supper? He says, this is my body, take and eat it. This is my blood, take and drink it. We don't take that literally. Now, some of those in, in that day, remember, when we read, we read about it, they took it literally and they said, Ugh. you know, and, and they, they left. But he wasn't talking in the literal sense. You know, like greed or envy or gluttony, or if you have a problem with alcohol. If you have problems with any of those things, you do your best to cut that temptation out of your life. And that's kind of how I'm seeing it, you know. And, and you can see the seriousness of sin. If Jesus is saying, you know, use it as an example, chopping your body parts off, which I know he doesn't. Because Christianity isn't the faith of self-mutilation. Uh, it's just showing the, the seriousness of sin. You need a lot to think about. I still say in in this these passages, I think it's still referring to the Jewish law and that, you know. Yeah, we do have to read it in that time frame. You know, that's where I said, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think he's specifically talking about causing a little child to stumble. He's talking about anyone who causes a child of God to stumble. And who was trying to cause that more than the Jews? I did it at the Catholic girl, and she, I remember her telling me, she says, I have to give something up for the men. And I don't know if any of that, giving up something that uh, is causing the or not. Did, did she give you up for one? Or? No, she wouldn't give it. <laughs>
there's a lot of things that can cause people to sin. You just have to try to cut a lot of that stuff out of your life. Okay, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, here's the verse, that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. A lot of people use this verse to say that we each have guardian angels. <clears throat> See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, that their angels, their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in So a lot of people try to use that to say that we have guardian angels. What do you think about that? Well, I think we do in a way. God sends us ways to guard us against sin and to help us. He doesn't just throw us out in the world and say, well, good luck staying away from that sin. I, I think he, I don't know how what an angel is or a guardian angel is, but he, he has some type of a way of helping you through your... Yeah, he is saying here that angels minister. Angels have duties. 
You found the truth. How did you find the truth? Was that a guardian angel? Ever? All I know is that after that, I didn't seek things out. Things sought me out. At that time, too, so demons were world. loose in the world. At that time, demons were loose in the world. And, you know, the angels were there to counteract them. And I'm not saying this is what it's talking about here, but, you know, I think at that time, the angels were more active than they are now, necessarily. I mean, I can't prove it. For all I know, they're as active today as they were at that time. But okay. At that time, there was a reason for them to intervene, because there was demons possessing people and stuff like that. Jesus is saying that angels are looking over. I'm using that. You know, these newborns, these little people, or new Christians, however you want to look at this, that angels are looking over them. So not only God is looking over them, but he has the angels assigned to look over them. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. He ended that whole thing. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. I come here to save a lost world. So don't do anything to hinder my work in saving the lost. If someone comes to Christ, they're saved, and then someone <coughs> tries to argue them out of, out of their Christianity. You know, at this time, it was predominantly the Jews trying to get him to go back. Verse 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. Thus, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What do you think that's saying? Go find the lost sheep. He's telling me, you know, I don't want anybody causing any of these to anybody to stumble. And if they do, they're, they're going to get punished. But what you need to do is to go find that lost sheep and bring them back into the fold.
No, it doesn't say that. If your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So he's telling them to go out and bring these people back that have strayed or been caused to stray. And now he's telling them really how to do that. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. If he listens to you, if he comes back, or if she comes back, you've won your brother. No, you won your brother. Christ is won. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that you may beat him with rubber hoses. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. This is a pretty smart thing to do. Especially if you're dealing with somebody that's really opposing you, for whatever their reason might be. You know, first you go to them in private. Now, I was called out on the carpet by uh, a couple individuals because I didn't stand up here and condemn in front of everybody an individual sin. <clears throat> Call that person out for that sin in front of everybody and just condemn them right there. Two, he's 
states, moreover, if your brother sins, plural, that means this is going on for a while. <clears throat> this sin has been going on between you and me for a while. And then you, then that brother that is sinned against goes to you privately, and if it doesn't, some resolve, then it keeps on going to a higher resolve. But if you leave it on, he doesn't hear you or want to believe what you know, what you didn't say, what it's a sin is a sin, period. Yeah. Now, I don't care what the sin is. And what it says here, <clears throat> and if your brother sins, some manuscript, <laughs> some manuscripts read, if your brother sins against you. Yeah. And that to me really where do you get that that's been going on for some time? To me, that's what I'm doing. Sins. I don't get that. No. But it's, 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 it's not saying. No. No, yeah. Active. Keeps on, keeps on doing, going on. Well, I could sit against you yeah. once, but then you want to address the issue. Yeah. But what happens if you let it go for a while? It keeps happening. You know, I think this has to be a descendants. Again, it's not just a regular sin, you know, we're talking morals. I think this is a sin that affects the church and affects the individual because Jesus tells Peter when he says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And he says, no, seven times, seventy. And some manuscripts say 777 times. You know, that you forgive your brother a small, you know, like he said, there's no such thing as a small sin. But there are some sins that are more grave than others. And I think this is referring to something that's major here because, you know, you know so-and-so is going out and getting drunk every Friday night, you know. Are you going to, you know, you should say something to them, but, you know, if they don't respond, what are you going to do? Take them to the church and drive them out where he has no hope at all? I think this is something different. And, you know, I can't prove it, but what adds to this is if your brother sins, that leaves it wide open. But, but like the sum of the manuscripts will say, if your brother sins against you, that narrows this whole thing down. If it's a sin against you, okay, you sinned against me, I'm going to go talk to you about that. And then if that don't work, then I'm going to bring a couple of people with me and we're going to go over it so I got witnesses. See, I, I agree with that. And that's why I was getting that. I think the sin here and I know I agree with what Keith is saying, sin is sin, but I think from the sounds of this, this is a serious sin. That you're, you know, if I walk by you and I don't speak to you on Sunday and I offend you, you're going to say, well, you didn't, you didn't speak to me. I'm taking you before the church. I mean, we're, we're talking about something far more serious. We're talking I, I about agree. something that, that I, I mean, it's, it's more than a casual sin. I think this is a Curious. Uh, okay, that's, that's a, well, like, in, you know, I'm an elder, and so what if I got caught at a strip club and it was made public news? It, it's still a sin, but if it's made public news, that's going to be a bad reflection on the church. Well, a lot of the references I get are from people that were sexual and immoral. You know, if you look at First Peter, Corinthians, and Galatians, some of the references. Oh, yeah, it was happening. And I'm not saying that that's what this means here, but it seems like some of the references and other letters written to the churches are dealing with that problem. Well, that was uh, quite an issue. You know, a lot of the different religions. Too, but what? I'm sure we have those issues in the world now, too. But. Yeah, but you, you, we don't have a, a, a church to Diana. You know, right. With legal prostitutes. Yeah, I had kind of this problem growing up. My father was an alcoholic. None of the neighbors would say anything. They know he was drinking, and the whole township knew he drank, and my stepmom would argue, and he'd beat up, but nobody would say anything. Now, to me, see, that is a sin, because nobody stepped forward and said, stop it. Well, you know, that reminds me of a 
Tell you a quick story about my mom. I've told some of you. When she was a little girl, she's in church with mom and her dad and brothers. And the lady reaches over to my mom and says, that man sitting next to you is drunk. My mom went, I know, that's my father. <laughs> he got called. Uh, all right, that should be enough for today. Good thoughts. We'll, we'll take up on that 15. Stephen, would you like to lead us in song? So, Sunday is New Year's Day. We are not having a conference luncheon this Sunday. We are having one on the 8th. But as Beck mentioned, our yearly business meeting is this Sunday. That's why we Sunday? Yeah, I just... <coughs> okay. 